right, again, everybody, today's topic is organic gardening. So thank you for being with us. Um, you know, this is an important topic that we really hope all gardeners will adopt at their homes uh, just for the health of our bodies and the health of the planet, the health of the soil, and the health of our, our plants and our food. So we're going to talk about edible gardening today. We'll talk about how to optimize your soil to grow the most healthy, resilient plants. And then we will go over some natural methods for plant pest and disease control. So why is this topic important? Well, I mean, I do like to emphasize here that organic gardening, while it is important, it, there is, it is a fairly reductive concept. Organic gardening really refers to what you're not using, right? It refers to not using toxic chemicals and pesticides. And that's the, definitely the way to go. We do want to stop the use of chemical fertilizers and pesticides that you know, pollute the groundwater, pollute the oceans, um, you know, really degrade the health of the soil and um, you know, the residual uh, toxins are bad for our bodies, they're bad for other organisms on the planet. So these are all good reasons to not use those chemical additives. But we really like to go beyond that and advocate for uh, regenerative gardening. So if you're not familiar with that term, regenerative gardening really takes organic, the concept of organic, but really takes it further so that we're really looking more at what we're putting back in, what we're doing to rebuild the soil and the health of the planet. And that's where um, practices like composting come into play and uh, just simply facilitating uh, a healthy ecosystem within your garden. So that's really the approach that we're gonna take to today's topics. So we always like to say it all starts with the soil. Um, I like to say feed the soil, the soil feeds the plants, and the plants feed you. And you know, soil is composed of both inorganic and organic compounds. So I'm not gonna get too, too sciencey about it, but basically the mineral or inorganic components of soil are gonna be sand, silt, and clay. And so your soil type is usually going to be some combination of those three compositions uh, or those three types. Sand is just what it sounds like. Um, it's grainy, the particles are bigger. Uh, you imagine the way the ocean goes in and out at the beach, the way it quickly drains from the sand on the beach. And that gives you an idea of what happens in your garden when you have very sandy soil. The water tends to run right through the soil. Uh, it may not really have a chance to be uh, uptake, uptaken or absorbed by the plant's roots. So sandy soil in the garden, particularly in an edible garden, is typically something you want to address um, by adding more organic matter. And, um, you know, trying to correct that overly sandy uh, condition. From sand, we get into silt. And now I'll bring in some of my visual aids here. Silt is um, composed of smaller particles than sand. So it's not as grainy, but it's kind of dusty. Uh, it's not really ideal either for absorbing water. So I'll do a little demo here to show you what I'm talking about. So here I have a jar. I've got some silty soil. It's kind of dusty. It's got a few rocks in it. It's not rich or amended with much organic matter. This is mostly of the mineral composition of the soil and it's mostly composed of silt. Pour in some water. Let's see what happens. Do you see the water? It's kind of sitting on top there. It's not really absorbing it very well. We got kind of a dusty layer. And then as it does sink in, it tends to not absorb evenly into the soil. And that's really because we don't have that organic matter in the soil to um, help with the, the water distribution and the water absorption and retention. And then from silt, we get into clay. So here I have a jar of clay soil. You can see these big chunks. Dry clay is as hard as a rock. 
Clay soil is probably the most difficult soil type to work with because it does get so hard um, and it's hard to penetrate with hand tools. And when you add water to clay soil, again, it tends to pool up on top. You see that puddle there without me pouring it onto my keyboard. And then once it does finally sink into the soil, it doesn't run, it doesn't filter through as quickly as you'd like it to. So while you don't want it to run right through the way it would in sandy soil, you also don't want it to get trapped and to sit the way it does when it gets absorbed into those tiny particles of clay soil because that can contribute to root rot for your plants. And now we're going to talk about the ideal composition and that's going to be loam. And loamy soil it usually has a dark rich look to it, has a nice feel or tilt is how we refer to the texture. Um, it often has a nice rich odor. And what loam is, is a combination of sand, silt, and clay. So those mineral compositions are in balance. Uh, you don't have too large of particles or too small of individual particles. So that's helpful for the water retention and the water flow through the soil. And then on top of that, what you have is a lot of organic matter. And organic matter is highly beneficial to your garden. Uh, it's beneficial for most plant types particularly edible plants. The only exception really is going to be things like succulents and certain coastal plants that actually prefer sandier soil. But for most of our garden needs and particularly edible gardening, you want a lot of organic matter in your soil. So let's see what happens when we add water. It sinks in right away, but it's distributed. It didn't just run straight through. So the surface of the soil is wet and it's evenly absorbed into the soil. And I always say you can usually tell you have good soil because when you water it, and I can never capture it quickly enough to show you guys, but there's the split seconds where um, the surface of the soil gets this glistening look. And that's that moment when it sits for just a brief second and then it sinks in. And that's, that's the nice even distribution you're looking for. So that's a little bit about your soil types. And I've used the term organic matter a lot now. So in case it's not clear what I'm talking about, organic matter is um, compost is a great example. So it's, you know, it's basically decomposed plants and living things, right? So if you have a garden where you have a lot of falling leaves or you're practicing, you know, perhaps uh, cover cropping or, or different methods that really get more uh, life into the soil, um, or, you know, good mulching practices, using dried leaves, leaf mold, leaf mulch. These are all examples of getting organic matter into your soil. But really, I would say the best way to consistently make sure you're amending your soil with the organic matter needs is to practice composting. So you'll hear me refer to composting quite a bit, even though this isn't a composting workshop, because it is such a key component to maintaining a healthy, thriving, garden with longevity. All right, let's, we'll get a little bit more into science now. So we talked about the composition of soil, and then we're going to talk a little bit more about the, the chemical uh, composition of soil, the chemical components and the nutrients in soil. So when we talk about pH, uh, we're referring to how alkaline or acidic your soil is. And most plants really do prefer to be in that neutral pH zone. So again, coming back to composting, um, adding lots of compost to your soil really does help to keep it in that nice neutral area where you want to be. So between you know 5.5, 7.5. Um, most plants, again, like to be right there in that neutral zone. There are some that prefer to be a little bit more acidic or a little bit more alkaline. So acidic would be lower on the pH scale, alkaline is higher. But I really like to emphasize here that it's a, it's a fairly small variant. So it's not, when we say some plants prefer more acidic soil, we're not talking down at the level of one or two. Um, it's really gonna be maybe more like five. Uh, and a, a good seed company will print on the seed packet the pH preference for that particular plant. But we do have a few examples here. So 
tomatoes, radishes, peppers, blueberries, and potatoes, like slightly more acidic soil, and then uh, asparagus, celery, I believe that's oregano and thyme, um, prefer it to be a little bit more alkaline. But again, most like to be in that, in that mid zone. So if you do want to make slight adjustments one way or the other, uh, you can use some, you can either purchase amendments at the nursery store or you could use some household ingredients. So a good way to make um, uh, acidic soil more alkaline would be to add wood ash or limestone. And a good way to make overly acidic soil slightly more, no, the reverse. Overly alkaline soil, more acidic, would be to add something like vinegar or coffee grounds. So coffee grounds are a really popular amendment if you're growing blueberries, for example. Uh, since we have some good soil here, let's put it to the test. So this, this is good soil. It's been amended with compost and other naturally uh, occurring organic matter. So ideally, we're going to have a nice neutral pH. So let's see. Let's see if I'm right. I'll let it sit for just a second. It's a little bit more toward the alkaline. I would call it about, oh, no, it's creeping down. It's creeping down, so just above seven. So this here is a pH meter. Uh, you can purchase it you know, at your garden supply store. And so if you really wanted to pay close attention and just provide the most optimal conditions for each uh, particular type of plant that you were growing, you might wanna pick up a pH meter. It's not necessary. I always emphasize that well-maintained soil is typically gonna be right in that neutral zone where you need to be, but if you wanna play with it a little bit, um, you can always pick up a pH meter. Uh, in addition to pH, there's Another important consideration with your soil, and that's going to be the nutrients. So those of you who are already avid gardeners may already be familiar with nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. And those are like the big three. Those are the main macronutrients that uh, most plants really desire. Uh, and, you know, with edible plants, we have kind of loose rule of thumb in terms of which nutrient corresponds to which type of plant growth. So generally speaking, nitrogen promotes green leafy growth. Um, potassium uh, promotes the development of the roots and phosphorus promotes the development of fruits and flowers. So that kind of gives you an idea if you're purchasing organic uh, amendments at your, at your nursery or um, home improvement store. And again, we do, uh, we do only advocate using organic fertilizers and amendments. You might want to pick one that's higher in nitrogen for your lettuce or other leafy greens and one that's higher in uh, phosphorus for um, your fruiting plants. Um, the big difference you might notice between chemical and organic fertilizers, if you are at the nursery, is that the numbers for the NPK, and they're usually shown as a ratio uh, on the bag, they're much higher for chemical fertilizers because they're, they're artificially produced, they're chemically produced, whereas organic fertilizers are their natural amendments, and so the numbers aren't as high. And while it can be tempting to use a chemical fertilizer because it's uh, quicker acting, um, and you, know, you will get a more immediate reward, uh, we really encourage you to resist that temptation because that false flush of growth can disrupt the life in the soil and it just disrupts the balance of natural nutrients that are available in the soil. So again, well-maintained soil typically already has a good amount of those macronutrients as well as a long list of micronutrients. So it's not only about the nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus good rich soil is so abundant in nutrients and just life and again the way to get there is to just um, really mimic nature as much as you can with your garden as opposed to manipulating it with chemical additives. So more to that point uh, we'll talk a little bit about the soil food web and all the all the living creatures in the soil. So uh, 
a teaspoon of healthy soil can have a billion living organisms. Now, of course, many of those we can't see. Many of those are microorganisms like bacteria and fungi. Um, but, you know, healthy soil, you'll also often see some critters crawling around. So I always like to say that if I'm assessing the health in my garden, uh, I'll usually uh, disrupt the surface of the soil a little bit and then I'll just observe. And if I see things starting to move around, uh, then I know that my soil is probably pretty healthy because there's a lot of life in it. So just quickly, we'll talk about the soil food web and, and, and basically the circle of life that that entails. So the roots of plants release gases called exudates. And the microorganisms like bacteria and fungi feed on those exudates. And then those microorganisms are in turn fed upon by protozoa, nematodes, and then we start getting into our macroorganisms. So the insects that you can see, the springtails, mites, roly polies, centipedes, millipedes, ants, beetles, mites, all that type of stuff. So those in turn get eaten by birds and mammals. Everything through the whole process is, of course, um, releasing its waste back into the soil, and then everything eventually dies and decomposes back into the soil. So that is how soil is built, right? That's where all of the organic matter comes into play that's supplementing the mineral content of our soil. And you really want it all to be there. And that's why we don't want to use chemical additives that could kill off some of these micro and macro organisms or just drive them away. Uh, I do like to show some foil here. So we'll see if we get lucky. I know there's some worms in there. So here's some healthy soil and we will pop the screen share again so we can see who's in here. Hopefully illustrate that concept of living soil. So I think you see some worms. Um, what else? I know there's at least one earwig in there. I definitely saw some mites, which may or may not show up on your guys' screens. But, oh, there's some more worms wiggling around. And worms really are soil superheroes. They help aerate the soil. They release their waste into the soil, which is chock full of nutrients and beneficial enzymes. So that's why, oh, there goes the earwig crawling around. So that's what good living soil should look like. And that's actually what you're going for. So hopefully you're not squeamish about bugs because um, they're, they're all part of the process. All right. Next question is, can you use fresh tomato leaves in composting? Yeah, absolutely. All right. If I live in an apartment, can I have a compost bin? If you live in an apartment, I recommend using a worm bin. I live in a condo and that's what I use. And it's nice because it's fully uh, self-contained. So I don't need to worry about critters getting into it. And it also doesn't take up a lot of space. And actually the Vermipro, you know how we mentioned at the top that we don't have the Wiggly Ranch available now, but we have the Vermipro model. It's nice because it is, it's very compact. So I think it would work really well in an apartment. And they can be kept indoors or outdoors. All right. I live in a very small, I live, I have a very small garden. Do you have a recommendation for purchasing worms in LA County? Oh, for purchasing worms. And we do get this a lot because if you purchase a compost bin from us and you live in LA County, then they do come with worms, but sometimes people want to purchase worms by themselves and we don't sell those by themselves because we simply don't produce enough worms to be able to do that. Uh, so my recommendation would be to try bait and tackle shops if you have any in your area. That probably only applies if you live near the coast, but it's the same variety of worms. They're called red wigglers. So they're sold at bait and tackle shops. Uh, and pet stores, I think, sometimes do stock worms because I know that some people feed them to their pet snakes. So you could try inquiring with some local pet stores. Yeah. Um, so we have another question here. The question reads, is it possible to turn silt, clay, or sandy soil into good loamy soil? Yeah, the best way to do that is to add as much organic matter as possible. All right, Erin, looks like we're good to move on. Okay, all right, thanks, Edgar. All right, so we're going to do um, kind of a, an overview of edible gardening right now. So obviously this is a very vast topic um, that you could go into great depth on, but we're going to 
uh, just offer some best practices uh, for anybody who wants to get started with edible gardening. So what we're trying to show here with this slide is uh, that you can pretty much grow anywhere. You don't need to have a large space. And I know we got some questions from people who live in smaller spaces and that does not need to be a limiting factor. There's plenty of options. You could do a container garden or possibly a raised bed. Um, we have some vertical options here, some, uh, some pots linked onto a fence. We have a trellis with some scarlet runner beans. So all of this to say that, you know, we encourage starting small anyway, if you are new to gardening. And if you have a small space, then that just kind of takes care of itself. So you can just, you know, I'll, I'll stop there and just say if that is a topic that anybody's interested in learning more about, I do recommend our small space gardening webinar. And we do provide more specific tips there. But really important if you are going to get into growing edible plants is to take into account the seasonality of those plants. Actually, I forgot these slides are out of order. Before I do that, let's talk about sun and shade requirements. So back to the space you're working with. Um, I keep meaning that swap these. Uh, you want to take into account how the sun moves across the space over the course of the day because there are some plants that prefer more sun and some that can get by with less sun. So when we say full sun, we're talking about six to eight hours of direct sunlight a day. And when we say partial sun or partial shade, using those terms interchangeably, that's going to be more like three, four, or five hours of sunlight a day. And even if you don't have a lot of sun, you can still grow food because there's a lot of things that grow well in partial sun. A few things grow in full shade, and we'll get to that in just a moment. But first, let's talk about the, the quick and dirty tips for what grows in full versus partial sun. And if you look at the plants in each category, you might see the pattern that the plants that really need more sun to grow are those that produce a fruit. And so when I say fruit, that's botanically speaking. So it's the part of the plant that has seeds in it. So that's gonna include things like berries and melons. It's also gonna include squash and peppers and tomatoes and cucumbers. These are all plants that do need a fair amount of sun so that they can form that mature part of the plant. And then the, the rule of thumb for plants that can grow with less sun, so in partial sun conditions, that's gonna be the plants that you eat the leaves and the roots of. So say you're not working with very much sun. So I don't get a great deal of sun either here on my balcony or in my community garden plot because it has a giant olive tree in the middle. So what I do is I grow a lot of leafy greens and root vegetables, so a lot of kale and chard and lettuce and um, beets and turnips and radishes, potatoes, sweet potatoes, leeks. These are all things that you can grow without so much sunlight. And then when we get into full shade, that's definitely a trickier category. Mint is included here because it seems to grow anywhere. Uh, full sun, partial sun, full shade. Uh, it also grows like a weed, most varieties. So um, we recommend confining it to a pot if you're gonna grow mint. And we did include mushrooms here because they do grow in the dark, but uh, I always advise to practice extreme caution if you're going to grow mushrooms because, you know, obviously there are very poisonous varieties and it can be pretty easy to um, misidentify an edible mushroom for a poison, poisonous mushroom. So just if you are going to grow mushrooms, uh, please be careful and make sure you know exactly what you're doing. And now we'll talk about seasons. So the next consideration, you know, if you want to be successful as a gardener, uh, you really want to make sure you're planting the right thing at the right time. And quite honestly, that can be a little bit uh, confusing here in LA County because we can grow year round and you will sometimes find things that are typically considered to be a warm or a cool season plant growing year round. Um, I, I've seen tomatoes growing year round. I, people grow kale year round. So there are, there are some general rules you do want to follow though, just to be as successful as possible. And that's, you know, that's the warm and cool season rule. So here in LA County, and again, it's also complicated because we encompass so many different uh, climates and microclimates, and there's extreme temperature fluctuations between the coast and the inland areas, but we've tried to generalize it best we can here into the cool season, which lasts roughly late fall through the winter. And that's when you're gonna be growing, again, a lot of those things that also don't need as much sun, right? So 
your leafy greens. Uh, peas do well in the cool season. Cabbage, garlic, and onions. Brassicas like broccoli and cauliflower and Brussels sprouts. These are all cool season plants. And then we have our bridge season, which is roughly spring. Um, it's usually fairly brief. And that's when it's good to get in things like radishes, which mature really quickly and like that uh, slightly warmer, but not yet hot weather. Same goes for beets, spinach, purslane, fava beans, cilantro. Cilantro especially, that's got a pretty short season. Uh, it doesn't like it too cold, but definitely doesn't like it too hot because it will start to bolt. So we have our, our bridge season crops. And then we get into our warm season, which is for many of us, our longest season. And sometimes it extends all the way through the fall and into the beginning of the winter here. And that's when you're gonna grow those sun loving crops like tomatoes, peppers, uh, corn, melons, squash, beans, strawberries. Those are gonna be our warm season plants. There are some things we can grow year round. Carrots are great because you can grow and harvest them year round. I just learned today, collards grow year round. I had thought of those as a cool season crop, but apparently they also can thrive through the summer here. Um, artichokes and also uh, rhubarb uh, and asparagus, these are perennials that come back year after year. We included Tuscan kale or you know, more of the dino kale variety here because it's so hardy that it seems to do well through the summer as well as the winter and usually will last at least a couple of years. Thyme, rosemary, marjoram, those woodier herbs, those you can grow year round. And then cane berries, those are going to be your raspberries, your blackberries, your boysenberries. They're perennials in the sense that you never pull them out. They will go dormant, um, so you'll want to cut them back, um, but then they'll come back in the summer and hopefully produce some lovely berries for you if they're being properly pruned. There are a few crops that are specially adapted to low water conditions because they've sort of, uh, you know, evolved to retain their own water. And those are going to be things like eggplants, grapes, peppery beans, purslane, which many people consider a weed, but it's actually very, very healthy, really high in, in nutrients. These are all good things to grow here uh, where we don't have a lot of water and, and you know, we're trying our best to conserve water even in the garden. A few takeaways for edible gardening before we move on to um, pest management. We do encourage those who are just getting started to start small and plant what you know you're going to eat. So in the handouts that we referred to earlier, we have a cool season handout and a warm season handout. And I believe you guys should have received both. The warm season goes through all the best practices for growing tomatoes. So you could still grow tomatoes now. Uh, they will continue to do well even though we're already pretty far into the summer because again we tend to have long summers here so we go through how to plant tomatoes from seed and from starts and then the cool season handout goes through the best practices for growing lettuce because tomatoes and lettuce seem to us like good starter crops for anybody who wants to try their hand at edible gardening and you know with lettuce it's great because it's always nice to be able to pick a salad we also encourage you to pay attention to spacing guidelines for plants. Uh, they're printed on the seed packet or on the little tab that comes when you buy seedlings from the nursery. It can be tempting to overplant just to fill up your space and have things look more lush and abundant and hopefully have you know, a bumper crop when it matures. But those spacing guidelines are there for a reason. The plants need space to develop both above and below ground. And if you overcrowd them, then you can encourage things like pests and disease. We also recommend a few best practices. If you aren't going to have an intimate relationship with your garden where you're checking on it pretty much every day or every other day, it's always a good idea to install a drip irrigation system on a timer so you can be ensured that your plants are getting all the water that they need. Uh, we always recommend water as close to the root system as possible. So overhead watering is not ideal. Uh, so you really want to uh, water close to the soil. Uh, maintain a good thick layer of mulch uh, that helps to reduce water retention from the soil and it can also cut down on your weeding. And you want at least two inches of mulch. And if you're using um, a natural mulch, which is what we recommend because it does build more organic matter into the soil, just keep in mind that it is going to break down over time and will need to be replenished. So when you lay your mulch, if you're laying it around existing plants, 
then obviously you just put it around the plants. But if you're mulching at the time of planting seeds, just make sure you leave a space clear where the seed is so that the sunlight can get to the seed and help it to germinate. And then as far as weeds go, just, I know easier said than done, but try to stay on top of it. Weed early and often is what we say. Try and get to them before they go to seed or before they are, their roots become really entrenched in your garden. All right, before we move on to our final topic, do we get any more questions, Edgar? Yes, we have a couple questions here. We have a couple people asking about free compost. Does Ellie provide free compost anywhere? So I've had a much harder time finding free compost for the last couple of years. It used to be available at a few different facilities. I remember Griffith Park had a free compost giveaway. Um, I know that there was an issue with one of the fires within the last couple of years. One of the facilities burnt and that affected supply. But I just am finding it harder to find sources for free compost. So my advice, kind of like I said to the person from San Diego earlier, would be to first check with your city. So I, city of LA, you know, I would go to the city of LA website and see if there's any resources currently listed. And if you live in a different incorporated city, like I know Culver City and Santa Monica do compost giveaways periodically. So, or you might wanna look into a nearby city that might do compost giveaways, um, assuming they're available to non-residents. And, Let's see, you could also check with your local hauler. That's a possibility. But what I've found is that it's become much easier to get free mulch than free compost. So um, yeah, these are just some sources I would check with, but um, it's always a good idea to make your own, you know, for that reason, it's not always as readily available for free as, as it once was, is what, I'm, what I found. And same goes with uh, wood chips and mulch, I'm assuming. Yeah, so wood chips, Chip Drop is a great site that you can check out. It connects people who are looking for um, mulch with like tree trimmers and stuff who are looking to unload it. So Chip Drop, uh, also you can check with the Department of Sanitation. You can just contact uh, tree trimmers in your area. There's a lot of places to get free mulch and wood chips. All right, we have a question here. The question reads, I have some soil that is very hard. Can I add leaves, coffee grounds, eggshells, etc., to soften it and make it more available for planting? If so, how long should I allow for the change? Yeah, those are great soil amendments. Uh, those are all great soil amendments, especially the leaves. Um, it's hard to say how long it will take. It really depends on how much labor you're putting into it. So how much you know elbow grease you're putting into actually digging those amendments in, how much water you're adding because Adding water also helps with that process. Um, yes, yeah, so the leaves are great. Coffee grounds are great. Keep in mind, it does make soil more acidic, so you don't want to overdo it on the coffee grounds. Eggshells, they're great. They add calcium to the soil. They take a long time to break down, though, so even if they're crumbled, I would recommend going a step further if you're going to use them as a soil amendment and actually grind them in a coffee grinder into a powder. But uh, really, I mean, everything you're mentioning are all or everything this person is mentioning are ingredients of compost and compost is the best way to amend any soil. So you could just do those ingredients you mentioned as well as your other fruit and vegetable waste and your other yard waste and throw it all into a compost bin and create compost and add that to your soil. And then it's gonna be even richer in a whole variety of nutrients that are gonna benefit that soil. But if it's really hard, it sounds like clay soil and it can take a lot of work. So it might take a while. Again, it really depends on how much labor you're putting into it. My compost has a lot of isopods. Is it normal and good for composting or do I need to reduce them? Yeah, so compost bins, and again, these are all questions we talk about in our Intro to Composting workshop, but compost bins are full of all sorts of in insects and they're supposed to be there. They're part of the process, so yes. Jordan. Can you, perfect, can you use peat moss as mulch? I don't see why not. It might break down more quickly than um, a piecier, thicker type of mulch, but yeah, I think peat moss would make a good mulch, especially because it's organic. Do you have any organic fungicides you recommend? Yes, copper fungicide. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. All right. 
I have an ant problem in my garden. What would be the best organic solution? Yes. So I was just researching that topic today because uh, in one of my gardens, it's just completely overrun with ants and they are hard to get rid of uh, organically. Um, some possibilities that I came across today were a vinegar solution. You could try that. Uh, borax mixed with jelly, I think. It, it was, a, it was um, if this person can email the address that's provided at the end of the workshop, I will go ahead and just send the article that includes all of the different recommendations for ants. But the best practice to, I guess, prevent your garden from being overrun with ants is to make sure the soil doesn't dry out too much. They don't like it when things are moist, uh, but that's not a foolproof method method. So there are different methods you could use like the two I just mentioned and you can feel free to email me and um, I'll do a bit more research on that for you. All right we have a big question here. Let's see if uh, let's see what it says here. So do you recommend a certain way of trellising? How about raised beds? Do you put in your comp what do you put in your compost with the worms? Do you recommend pruning leaves once your vegetables start fruiting? Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, in terms of recommending a certain kind of trellising, no, I mean, it depends on the type of plant. Uh, just, you know, any type of support structure and some sort of tie to secure the plant to the support structure will work for plants that line upward. Um, I'm not sure about the question for raised beds. Um, I'm not sure what the, they're asking there, but let's see. Worm compost and pruning. So worm composting, again, really we go into detail on all this in our composting workshop, but worm compost bins can take yard waste and kitchen scraps, fruit and vegetable scraps. That's the short answer. But to really get the whole breakdown, um, please do attend our Intro to Composting webinar. And in terms of pruning plants, once they've started to produce their, their fruits, uh, it's not typically necessary. I mean, unless we're talking about something like the caneberries that need to be cut back and pruned every year, uh, it would really depend. So for example, if you had tomatoes and they were extraordinarily bushy and they were growing every, going all over the place and it didn't work for you and you wanted them to start not produce so much vegetative green growth and put more energy into producing their fruit, you might consider pruning them. But for most vegetable gardens, they don't typically require a lot of pruning. Thank you, Erin. And uh, we do have a guest stating that LA Sanitation has a location in Silmar that they have free mulch and compost. And compost, excellent. That's great to know. Thank you for sharing that. All right, Erin, let's move on. Okay. All right, so Integrated Pest Management or IPM, this is really just uh, offering ways to address uh, those ever-present pests and diseases that show up in our gardens. So we have a sort of a step-by-step -step process. So we start with cultural, a cultural approach. And so when I say cultural, that's referring to horticulture, right? So it's using best practices in your garden. That's gonna be planting the appropriate thing at the appropriate time of year, giving your plants the proper spacing, using clean tools in your garden. So particularly if you prune a plant that has um, pests or disease, make sure you're sanitizing those garden shears, make sure you're keeping them sharp, and make sure you're just building your soil with compost. So beneficial fungi and bacteria, that really refers to supplementing your soil with good organic matter that adds nutrients and life to the soil. From there, we get into biological. So biological pest control, and I'll go into more detail on the next slide. Biological pest control really refers to taking advantage of beneficial insects to address your harmful insects. So this is, in some ways, it's more of an academic exercise and something you can actually put into practice effectively because you can't necessarily tell the bugs what to do. Uh, you could have an aphid problem and you could order some ladybugs or buy them at the nursery and release them into your garden. Those ladybugs might all fly away. I've seen it happen on more than one occasion. Uh, but really, the purpose of understanding biological control is more about recognizing the beneficials versus the harmfuls in your garden. And again, we'll cover that in more detail on the next slide. Now we get at physical addressing of the issue. And that's, you know, when it comes to snails, for example, just removing them from the garden. 
caterpillars, same thing. You can do hand picking and then dispose of them however you see fit. Cabbage worms, tomato hornworms, all those pests. You could just you know, go through and pick them off. If you have a small enough garden, that could be feasible. Um, barriers, sticky tape. Sticky tape's great for white flies. Barriers, uh, an example would be taking a cut off plastic water bottle and placing it around a delicate seedling and that will keep the snails and slugs from getting to it while it's in that delicate state before uh, it loses interest to them. And then we get into chemicals. So when we say chemical, we're really talking about using organic sprays or so natural sprays. We had the question about copper fungicide earlier. That's an organic spray uh, that's really good at addressing powdery mildew. Uh, some others that I recommend, and we have a few examples here. Some people try mixtures of garlic and onions or perhaps essential oils or simply dish soap, vegetable oil. The uh, natural insecticides, organic insecticides that I've found to be the most effective are going to be insecticidal soap, like we've listed here, and neem oil uh, and bioneem. These are all pretty good effective sprays for many of the pests that we're about to discuss. But the reason we mentioned cultural, biological, and physical control first is because when you spray, even with an organic spray, when you use that to spray the pests, you're also going to possibly harm the beneficial insects, so including those in the soil. So that's why we still use it as last resort, even if we're using organic ingredients. So let's talk a little bit more about biological control. Um, we have a few of our most common pests listed here on uh, the left. It's by no means comprehensive, but we tried to pick out some of the most common. So we've got aphids, I'm sure most of you are familiar, tomato hornworms, cabbage worms. So Cabbage worms are those little green caterpillars that just completely decimate your plants, especially things like kale and brassicas. We have white flies, spider mites, which uh, especially in hotter, drier areas, they form webs. You might see them over your tomato plants and you'll see the teeny little spiders crawling through the webs. And then we have mealy bugs. So those are those white fuzzy things that kind of congregate in the nooks and crannies of your plants. And many of these insects attract secondary insects. So you want to try and control them as quickly as possible. So along the top here, we've showed uh, some of the beneficial insects. So surfid flies and trichogramma wasps are both beneficials. And they look kind of like little bees buzzing around. And they might seem pesky, but they're actually your friends because they go after things like aphids and tomato hornworms and cabbage worms. Taconid flies, same thing. They um, parasitize the, uh, those caterpillars. They actually lay their eggs in their bodies and then the eggs hatch and they, and they kill the caterpillars. So those are beneficial when it comes to those, those caterpillars that are eating your plants. Ladybugs are great. They go off after all those little small critters like the aphids, the white flies, the mites, the mealybugs, lacewing, same thing. These are also ones that you can typically buy or mail order to release into your garden. Praying mantis eats pretty much everything. They're huge predators, so you can see they kill everything on this list. They also, you know, they'll kill beautiful butterflies as well. So um, they're definitely major predators in the garden. And I do have, I can always count on my kale to give me some aphids to show. So probably most of you have seen aphids, but if not, see them on there. Obviously I need to take better care of this kale. It's ironic. I feel like my patio garden is my most neglected because I spend all the time in my other gardens. So those aphids, they come in all different colors. These ones are mostly gray. They're gross. They produce this honeydew that then attracts ants and makes your plants sticky. They're hard to wash off. They're just, they're just no good. And then here I found this leaf from my pepper plant it has some white flies on it. So those little white things are um, the white flies and they also produce honeydew which attracts ants but also can um, create a secondary issue of sooty mold which is like a black residue on your plants. So again stuff that you don't want. So what else did I want to mention here in terms of addressing insects? 
Oh, we didn't list snails and slugs here, but they can be a pretty common problem in the garden. I did mention that you could use the barrier control to place something around the seedling to keep them from getting to it. But another thing that I found works pretty well is diatomaceous earth. So the stuff you get at the uh, pool supply store, you can sprinkle that very liberally around your plants and that not only deters the snails and slugs, but uh, it also deters things like earwigs, which aren't necessarily pests, but uh, a lot of these creatures don't really like it. So it's a good way to protect your plants, um, but you do need to reapply it. Make sure you apply it after you water because the water causes it to soak in and renders it ineffective. So it needs to be used liberally and reapplied. But I do want to mention DE or diatomaceous earth because it's pretty effective, especially against snails and slugs. And now let's talk about a few common diseases. Again, not a comprehensive list, but we want to touch on a few of the most common. Um, powdery mildew, you know, that's also present on my kill. So I'm not gonna stop the screen share, but you can just see the white powdery stuff. That's powdery mildew. It's really common, especially in the more coastal areas because moisture in the air causes it to spread. It's one of the main reasons we talk about watering the soil and not the plant, because when you get the leaves of the plant wet, that encourages uh, the growth of mildew and other types of blight. So again, if you're having a lot of powdery mildew, apart from your best practices of watering the soil and not the plant, you can spray with copper fungicide. Uh, you also, with all of these diseases, you want to remove the affected parts of the plant as quickly as possible to get that disease out of your garden before it spreads. Mosaic virus, it's common on beans and peppers and eggplant. You can usually see the leaves become this mottled pattern of green and yellow uh, that looks, you know, again, it's got that, well, like the name says, it's kind of got that mosaic look. And again, you want to get those plants out as quickly as possible. And try to control your pests because the pests spread the disease. Damping off usually happens when you overwater. It's common with little baby plants. So if you overwater and the soil doesn't have good drainage, the stem can just rot, the plant will flop over. So avoid overwatering, remove the affected plants. Powdery mildew we talked about. Verticillium and fusarium wilt, these are really common, especially on tomato plants. And they're pretty much indistinguishable from each other. They're both characterized by one half of a branch just withering and yellowing and shriveling up the leaves on one side. And they're stubborn diseases they are hard to get rid of. So again, you wanna prune those off quickly, make sure you sterilize your pruning shears and avoid the reinfection rate by practicing crop rotation, which just means not planting the same plant or something from the same family of plants that's susceptible to that particular disease in the same area of your garden for at least three years. Uh, it's the best way to get rid of those because they can be harbored in the soil. And then blossom end rot, it's actually not so much a disease as a deficiency. And you might have seen it on like your squash or your tomatoes or your eggplant or your peppers. You'll have a beautiful healthy fruit starting to form and then the next day you go and the end that had the blossom attached is starting to shrivel up and rot. Uh, and that usually is due to a calcium deficiency in the soil. So you can address that by adding uh, an amendment that's rich in calcium, like bone meal, oyster shells, gypsum, or ground up eggshells. So I mentioned before grounding egg, grinding eggshells into a powder. That's a great way to apply calcium to your soil. Can you repeat the product used for snails? Yes, diatomaceous earth. And it's often referred to as DE for short. Where do you get copper fungicide? Um, I've gotten it, we're not supposed to recommend actual commercial places, but I've gotten it at major um, home improvement stores. All right, uh, let's see here. Is there anything for fungus, for fungus nets or leaf miners? For fungus gnats, gnats or leaf miners. Yeah, leaf miners are tough. One recommendation for leaf miners is when you see they first started to burrow into the leaf to try and smush them before they really start to tunnel through because uh, they're hard to spray for because they are inside the leaf. Uh, fungus gnats, I'm not totally sure what those are. So I can't 
make a recommendation for that other than, well, you know, sticky traps actually, because any flying insect they're going to be effective against. So you could get either the hanging sticky traps or lay sticky tape around, uh, and that would probably work against any type of gnat. All right. How do you deal with random mushrooms popping up in your soil? So mushrooms, you know, I just knock them down, but they're not they're not bad. They're actually, I mean, they're bad if you eat them because they could be poisonous. So if you have kids or pets that you're concerned about, I would just remove them and uh, dispose of them. But they're actually a sign of good, healthy soil. So if you have mushrooms sprouting in your garden, that's probably a good sign about your soil. But yes, if you're concerned about them being poisonous, uh, just carefully remove and dispose of them and wash your hands. All right, how about if leaves on our plants are turning yellow? So the funny thing about yellowing leaves is they can be either a sign of over or under watering. So <laughs> um, it's hard to know without knowing your practices in your garden, but I would check, I would first start by checking the amount of water you're adding. Um, if your leaves are pale, like they're not as vibrant as a, of a green that they, as they should be, that's usually something that can be addressed by adding a nitrogen rich organic uh, soil amendment or fertilizer. How do I avoid worms eating my corn? Um, see, I haven't grown corn personally, and I know that, that that crop can attract a lot of pests. So that's one that I don't feel comfortable answering without any research or firsthand experience. So back to the email address here. Again, please, if I don't address any questions to your satisfaction, email me here and um, we can follow up that way. All right, let's see here. What type of insecticidal soaps do you recommend? Uh, well, we can't really refer any specific uh, brands. So, um, you know, there's plenty of organic options out there. You could even experiment with just, if you have um, an earth-friendly dish soap that you use at home, you could make your own spray using that diluted with water. I can't tell you the ratio offhand, but I'm sure you could Google that or email me. Um, so you could just make your own, um, but again, we recommend earth-friendly ingredients. So, you know, one of those earth-friendly brands of dish soap, if you wanted to try making your own insecticidal soap, that could be effective. Um, and I think that's it. Any other, anything else we need to address, Edgar? I think we're all good, Erin. Okay. Well, in that case, thank you everybody for being with us today. Um, we really appreciate you taking your time to attend these webinars. And Edgar, thank you for moderating. All right. Bye, everybody. Thank you.